were it not Order, for Senator the fact Patrick, I'm running out of time. We'll move to question time. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding ministerial absences. Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator Canavan will be absent from question time today for personal reasons. In Senator Canavan's absence, Senator McKenzie will represent the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, the Minister for Regional Services, Decentralisation and Local Government and the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. I further advise uh, the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time today due to ministerial business overseas. In Senator Reynolds' absence, Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Defence, the Assistant Defence Minister, the Minister for Veterans um, and Defence Personnel, and the Minister for Defence Industry. Senator McKenzie will represent the Minister for Communications, <laughs> Cyber Safety and the Arts. Thank you. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Rustin. Can the minister confirm that because of the government's delays, staffing caps and the lack of services, more than 77,000 Australians with disability are missing out on the NDIS? The minister representing the Minister for the National Disability hmm. Insurance thank Scheme, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, no, I cannot confirm that's the case. What? Senator Billick, Seriously? supplementary question. Well, it would be nice if the minister knew a job, but anyway. Uh, my first supplementary. Yesterday the minister said, and I quote, this is a demand-driven system. That means that people who wish to access the system do so at their demand. I refer to the case of Ms Shannon Manning from Queensland, whose profoundly disabled daughter Meadow has been waiting more than a year to get a wheelchair and hoist. Is this what you mean by demand-driven system? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Billick, for your follow-up question. As Senator Billick would be well aware, it would be completely inappropriate for any of us to come into this place and start to debate the individual, complex and sensitive components of an individual person's uh, disability plan. Uh, however, the Minister of the National Disability Scheme in the other place, I know, Mr President, on frequent frequent occasions has offered those opposite and those opposite in the other place a briefing on any of these issues in relation to individual cases because he believes that it's appropriate Order. to discuss them behind the scene. But as I said yesterday, uh, this is a demand-driven scheme and we will continue, like we do with many other demand-driven schemes, order. to make sure Senator, it continues Senator, to be funded. Senator Watt, on a point on of order. On relevance. We're seeking an explanation of the minister's comments yesterday that this is a demand-driven system. She has not addressed that. We've given an example, and we'd like her to explain whether this is what she means by a demand-driven system. With, with, with respect, um, Senator Watt, you had a quotation from the minister, and then you, you, uh, the case, there was an, an individual case claimed and mentioned. I think the minister is being directly relevant to the question in speaking, in speaking to that question first about. The, uh, an approach to dealing with an initial case, and I heard her talking about the phrase you mentioned, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. As I said, um, we are not going to come into this place and discuss individual cases. It would be inappropriate and disrespectful to the individual concerned. Order. Senator Pratt, on a point of order. Point of order, Mr. President. The, the minister might has not order. claimed public interest order? immunity as a grounds for not answering this question. Uh, you can't automatically just say you don't want to answer it because you're talking about someone's specific personal Order. circumstances, Senator, unless you're seeking to use that as a grounds for public well, interest immunity. Um, Senator Pratt, I, I will say, at least in my le length of time here, which has matched yours, that it is common for ministers to say they are not dealing with individual circumstances of government programs. I believe that's consistent. Um, there is a different process with the seizing of uh, the um, documents being demanded and Senate estimates. Um, on this point, I think the minister is being directly relevant, and I'm not of the view she needs to make such a claim to answer the question in this fashion. Senator Rustin, she has concluded. Senator Billick, a final supplementary question. Thank you. My second supplementary. We'll see if we can get a proper answer. The defining feature of the 2018-19 19 final budget outcome is the Morrison government's 4.6 billion dollar underspend on the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Why is the Morrison government propping up its budget by denying Australians with a disability the care they need, deserve and were promised? Senator Rustin. We are not. Order. Senator Bragg. 
Senator Bragg. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Can the Minister provide an update to the Senate on the budget repair efforts of the government? The Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Bragg for that question. Uh, indeed, we have kept the economy growing and created more jobs despite the headwinds we have been facing. And we have controlled our expenditure growth. I am pleased to report that that is why in 2018-19 our budget has returned to balance for the first time in 11 years. Senator, Senator the underlying Watt. cash balance in the final budget outcome for 2018-19 is $13.8 billion better than estimated at the time of the budget. The $690 million deficit represents a 0.0% of represents 0.0 per cent of gross domestic product. Keeping the economy growing, boosting employment growth and controlling expenditure growth have been the key features of our budget repair effort. Nominal GDP Senator grew Watt. by 5.3 per cent, significantly higher than the 2018-19 budget forecast of 3 and 3 quarter per cent. This is the third year in a row that the underlying cash balance in the final budget outcome is materially better than anticipated at the time of the budget. Over the past three years, the final underlying cash balance outcome was $37 billion better than forecast at budget, compare that to LIBOR's Order. last three years in government when the outcome was $70 billion worse than a forecast at budget time. Furthermore, this is also the fifth year in a row, five out of five, that the employment growth outcome is better than the employment growth forecast Order. at budget time. 2.7 per cent employment growth last year, followed by 2.6 per cent employment growth this year, well above the 1.5 per cent employment Order. growth forecast at budget time and well On above the right 1.9 per cent um, long-term average. For the second year in a row, we kept spending as a share of GDP below the long-run average of 24.7 per cent. Spending as a share of GDP was headed for 26.5 per cent under LIBOR and rising and Order. is now down to 24.6 per cent. Order. Before I call Senator Bragg, despite having a very loud voice, I was struggling to hear Senator Cormann and Senator Watt. I did call your attention a number of times. While there's something about that particular seat that does amplify someone's voice, from my experience, I would ask you to spend the next answer pondering silence for a while. On my right, order, order, Senator. On my right, they should not be responding to disorderly interjections when I repeatedly call them to order. Senator Bragg. Thank you. How does the final budget outcome for 2018-19? demonstrate that the government's economic and fiscal plans are working. Uh, thank Order, you very Senator much, uh, Mr President. What our final budget outcome shows is that, it, that our plan is working to create more jobs and it is also working to ensure Australians can continue uh, to uh, receive the essential services Australians rely on. For Order. example, over the last financial year, we have more than, doubled, more than doubled government expenditure on the NDIS, increasing it from $4 billion in 2017-18 to $8.5 billion uh, in 2018-19. More than doubled. In fact, in 2018-19, an additional 150,000 Australians transitioned to the NDIS, taking the total number of participants to, over, to about 300,000 by the end of June 2019. We expect that around 500,000 Australians with a disability will benefit from the NDIS over the next five years. Importantly, importantly, um, importantly as I say again, we more than doubled uh, the expenditure Senator on the NDIS Coleman, in 2018. Time for the answer has expired. On my left. Senator Bragg. What are the key risks to job creation, economic growth and returning the budget to surplus? I, I remind, on my right, I would encourage you to not respond to interjections. On my left, I am reminded this is a forum for non-government parties. I am not going to call questions or answers until I can hear them. Senator Cormann. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, we do continue to face global economic headwinds, and we continue to deal with the effects of the drought and the floods on our domestic economy. Uh, however, on the back of lower interest rates, lower taxes, higher investment in infrastructure, a more competitive exchange rate, and a pickup in the resources sector, we will keep the economy growing, creating more jobs, and generating more revenue for government to fund the essential services Australians rely on. Uh, I should say that the other risk to our economy uh, is uh, none other than the shadow treasurer, Dr. Chalmers. Uh, he recklessly and irresponsibly continues to talk the economy down. His leader appears to be too weak to get him to do the right thing by Australia. He, his leader appears to be too weak to get him to do the right thing by Australia. Labor has not delivered a surplus since 1999. Senator Bragg was in kindergarten then. Senator Chandler wasn't even born then. The Labor Party doesn't know how to manage the economy, doesn't know how to manage the budget. Senator, actually, before I call you Senator Gallagher, could I order, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber of a parliamentary delegation from Japan and members of the Young Political Leaders Exchange Program led by Mr Ichiro Asawa, chair of the Japan-Australia Parliamentary Friendship Group. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to a slightly noisy Senate. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Rustin. Recent media reports have revealed it takes an average of 127 days, 127 days for a child to receive an NDIS plan from the day they are deemed eligible. In some instances, the wait can be as long as 202 days. Why are Australian children with a disability waiting so long for care and support they need? The Minister representing the Minister for National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Rustin. Well, look, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much to Senator Gallagher for her question. Um, as I explained yesterday on numerous occasions, and as I explained earlier, and I think uh, the, the leader of the, the government in the Senate just uh, added his contribution uh, about the extraordinary um, increase in delivery. Uh, and speed an exponential increase in delivery uh, in the delivery of the NDIS um, over recent times. But what I would actually like to draw to the attention of the chamber um, is what we inherited and what we have done since we inherited this. Order, <coughs> Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, direct. Order. Yeah. I'd like to. Where you come from, I'd, I'd like to oh. hear what? Senator Wong's point of order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Point of order direct relevance. The minister hasn't been asked about Labor's policies in government seven years ago. She's been asked. She's been asked about the average wait time for children with a disability in this country. I would have thought that she would have sufficient empathy to respond to that question. Senator Cormann, on, the point of on, on that point of order, in order to answer that question in a way that is directly relevant and to explain uh, where we are now and why. It is absolutely uh, important and directly relevant to explain where we came from as we uh, proceeded to implement this very important scheme uh, as quickly as possible, given the bad state of affairs that Labor had left behind. On the, on the point of order, Senator Wong, I believe, was anticipating where the minister was going with an answer. Um, I, 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 I don't believe that context is always not directly relevant. I am listening carefully to the minister's answer. She's only been speaking for 34 seconds. I will continue to do so. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. As I was um, attempting to tell the chamber, um, as this, uh, this once you know, absolutely massive, massive reform in this area, probably the most massive reform that we've seen since Medicare, um, is being transitioned through. You need to remember that this is a, 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 a program that requires the investment of the states and through that very complicated transition. But what I would remind those opposite of, um, I would remind those opposite of, of uh, the, um, the Productivity Commission's recommendation that they hold it back for another year to enable their, the, uh, the NDIA to be able to get the program order. up and running. Senator Senator Gallagher on the point of order, order on relevance, um, Mr. President. The the specific it's, it, it was not a broad question about the NDIS, its historic origins and its transition to where it is now. It was around the weights for children with a disability. It was quite specific. We've allowed 
The minister to provide the context. Could she please now come to the, the substance Senator, of the Senator question? Senator on the point of order. I, I, you know, on the point of order and why this is directly relevant. I know the Labor Party don't want to hear this, but uh, the starting position that we inherited is directly relevant to the reasons why we are where we are. Directly relevant, and that's, that's why, if Labor was interested in the truth, they would let the minister order. answer the question. Um, on, on the on the point of order, on the point of order, the, the, the point on direct relevance you're raising, Senator Gallagher, goes to the part of the question I believe you said. Why are there being so? Wait, wait. Now, but, hang on. I, I, I don't. I. Um, I'll rule when. I don't. I'm not willing to rule out a question that asks why a minister explaining material that she believes to be directly relevant and that, in my hearing from this chair, I am not willing to say is not directly relevant when the question commences with why. Um, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. The reason that the waits are so long, as you, write, as you um, are just putting it, um, and have been reduced significantly under this government, the fact that 115,000 people, 115, people have gone on it in the last uh, 12 months. But what I would go back to my point, Mr. President, and that is that we inherited a program that was half built when we got it. But the problem was, as was said by the NDIA review, that basically what we inherited from those officers was an agency is like a plane that took off before it had been fully built and is being completed whilst it's in the air. Well, we've completed it while it's in the air. We've completed it. If you'd like to have a look at what you left us, and we are delivering on the plan. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary uh, question. Thank you, Mr President. I refer to nine-year-old Angus, whose family were left to transport him around the family farm in a wheelbarrow because of the delays with the NDIS providing him a wheelchair. Yesterday, the minister said, and I quote, we should make no apology about the fact we, are, we manage our budgets appropriately. Why is the government propping up its budget position with a $4.6 billion underspend in the NDIS, a fact confirmed by the minister in the House just in question time, when children like Angus are waiting for Order, essential Senator equipment Gallagher, like time this? Time for the question has expired. Uh, Senator Birmingham, on a point of order. A point of order on the question, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. Can I hear standing orders? Order. Standing okay, orders. Honestly, just um, I'm going to. When I can hear Senator Birmingham's point of order, I'll I'll call him to make it. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, standing orders uh, state the questions shall not contain names of persons unless they are strictly necessary to render the question intelligible and can be authenticated. Now, Senator Gallagher. As has been Order. made plain, Mr. President, uh, on previous instances by Senator Rustin, this government will always receive individual cases from any member of parliament and deal with them Order. respectfully. Senator. In this case, though, it is very clear that this person, of course, cannot be authenticated unless the opposition is willing to bring the case to the government. Um, Senator Wong, did you want to take the? I'll call you when there's silence as well. Senator Wong, on, a point, on the point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as I understand the point of order, that the point of order is that there is a name in the question. The second accusation, which I do not believe is uh, a point of order, is a suggestion that this is somehow fabricated. I make clear it is not. The name is included because it is a name of a person. A person who, who and we are asking questions about his circumstances. Uh, and why it is that the services in a so-called demand-driven system are not being provided to it. Senator Cormann on the point of order. I, I think on this, on this point of order, it, it, is, it is quite reckless and irresponsible for the uh, opposition to breach the standing order in this fashion, because, because, the, because the Labor Party actually does know that there is a transition underway, which will lead to a full rollout of the NDIS in 2020, and that 115,000 more people are Senator getting uh, services now than, than did last year. Okay. Senator Senator Wong, on the point of order. On the point of order, we are not going to disrespect Australians by calling this person a kid. Or, he has a name. Order. Look, I have granted both leaders at the table some discretion, more than I grant any other senator when it comes to raising points of order. I would ask that it not be 
stretched further for debate across the table. Firstly, Senator um, Birmingham's point of order. He correctly read out the standing order. I think it would assist senators asking if they are asking questions if they provided a reference, as has been done in custom and practice, to a media report, which allows it at least the claim to be verified. This did not do that. I'm not going to rule the question out of order because it is consistent with past practice that I can ask the minister to answer that part of the, quest, uh, part of the question. But I will ask ministers, oh, sorry, senators, if they are going to use examples or case studies, that they keep that standing order in mind. And one of the ways to address that has been to refer to a report in a media piece. So at least, if the minister wished to take it on notice, there would be details. In this case, it would be very hard because I didn't hear a reference to an external reference. Senator Rustin. Mm, thank you. At last. As I have made comment earlier, and I, I still feel like I almost need to pull a point of order on myself for repetition here, um, but it is not appropriate for us to be debating an individual case in full public view in this place. If you were genuinely, genuinely interested in helping out this individual case, you would bring it either to myself or to, to Minister yeah. Roberts in the other place yeah. to be able to deal with it. We don't know who this person is because you're not identifying who they are. So to come in here and Senator, can I take Senator Wong's? saying it's not my problem. I'm actually saying, yes, it is my problem, Senator Wong. Yes, it is my problem, and I'm prepared to do something about it. But I can only do something about it if you are prepared to go through the right channels, the respectful channels, and actually demonstrate that you care about this child. You would bring the case to me to allow us to be able to deal with this individual issue. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Extraordinary. Thank you, um, Mr President. My supplementary question is, Australia has the slowest growth in a decade, Sna stagnant wages, productivity in decline, record household debt, high underemployment and declining living standards. When will the government realise that shortchanging Australians with a disability is not an economic policy? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Well, first and foremost, I dis uh, absolutely reject the premise of that because we are not dis uh, dis uh, shortchanging anybody with a disability. But the thing that's actually causing me the greatest amount of concern here is obviously those opposite who would profess to be the alternative government obviously don't understand what a demand driven system is. If you understood what a demand driven system is, you would understand why you would understand why this particular program responds to the demand. Now as we heard um, we've heard that the actual individual amounts of money per, per individual um, program are not reducing. The individuals who are on plans are receiving al almost exactly what was expected. However, because we inherited your half-built plane and we've tried to spend the last while fixing it, we knew we were going to end up with slightly lower numbers of people coming onto the, uh, to the scheme. And the reflection of the fact that the number of participants ending, entering the scheme has been lower. Um, but what we can Order, say Senator is Rustin. Senator Dinatale. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Special Minister of State, Senator Cormann. Senator Cormann, uh, over 2,000 Australian businesses have registered at the website This Is Not Business As Usual, and that number is growing by the minute. These companies are supporting their employees in taking time off work to go and join tomorrow's worldwide climate strike to tell governments to stop pretending that everything is going to be OK. They're saying to all of us in this place that it's time to confront the frightening climate emergency that's unfolding. Minister, will you, as the minister responsible for the public service, guarantee that there will be no retribution or punishment against any Commonwealth public servant who leaves work to attend the strike? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Um, well, let me just firstly say that our government uh, is committed to effective action on climate change. And indeed, we have a plan. Uh, we, we, we are on track to meet and exceed our emissions reduction targets uh, that agreed, agreed to in Kyoto by 2020. And we have a plan to meet our emissions reduction target uh, agreed to in Paris by uh, 2030. Uh, the next point is uh, that all of the uh, public servants across uh, the uh, great world-class Australian public service know what their duties and responsibilities are, uh, and I would encourage all uh, of our outstanding public servants uh, to conduct themselves appropriately consistent with the rules. Order. Senator I was on my feet before he, uh, the minister had concluded. 
Uh, so, point of order. Uh, I asked a very specific question, and it was a point of order on relevance. Yeah. I'd asked, I asked the minister whether he would guarantee that there would be no retribution well, or punishment for public service workers. The, the minister um, was being. Well, you had a preamble to the question. I think the minister was being directly relevant to elements you stated in your preamble, but he has concluded his answer. So you, you have a supplementary question now, Senator Dinatali. Uh, Minister, tens of thousands of school students, uni students, workers, employers, retirees, firefighters and farmers uh, are joining together in 95 different regional centres and capital cities to demand three things. No new coal, oil and gas projects, 100 per cent renewable energy by 2030 and a just transition for fossil fuel workers. Minister, will you support their demands? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Firstly, I mean, what people do in their private time and their free time is a matter for them. I mean, we are a great democratic nation, and I'm quite relaxed about the causes that people want to support. Uh, personally, I'm not uh, in favour of uh, that uh, particular proposition that you've put because I think it doesn't serve, it wouldn't serve Australia well. What I would say uh, in relation to students, in particular, that you've just referenced, uh, students should go to school. When school is sitting, students should go to school. That is what will prepare them to be the best possible contributors uh, to their communities and our nation into the future. Senator Dinatali, a final supplementary question. Well, Minister, students are fed up. They're fed up with inaction from your government. Minister, these are people who have had a gutful of governments who are in the pocket of a coal, oil and gas lobby and refuse to take action on climate change. Minister, my question to you is how good are climate strikers? How good are they? Senator Cormann. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I, I completely and utterly reject the offensive premise of the question. The offensive premise of the question. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is Australia's public interest. We are focused on uh, building a stronger economy and on protecting the environment in a way that is economically responsible because we care about the opportunities of, of Australians to dine into the future to get ahead. We care about that. And uh, so, you know, as I said in my previous answer, I'm quite relaxed about what causes people want to pursue uh, in their private time. That's a matter for them. Uh, but uh, you know, I think the position of the government is very clear. Senator Patrick. <clears throat> Mr. President. Uh, pursuant to Standing Order 72.2, I have a question for you. My question arises from your joint statement with the Speaker on the 8th of February and your statement to the Senate on the 12th of February concerning a security intrusion into the Australian Parliamentary Computing Network. On the 12th of February, you said, and I quote, I'm not in a position to provide any information regarding attribution of responsibility for this intrusion. It is also likely to be some time before the investigation to this incident is concluded. I will provide further and relevant details to senators as appropriate. On Monday this week, Reuters reported that our cyber security agency, the Australian Signals Directorate, concluded in March that China's Ministry of State Security was responsible for hacking the parliamentary network. Have you now been briefed on the findings of the ASD investigation? When did that briefing take place? What updates can you now provide the Senate? And was China responsible? Thank you, Senator Patrick, and thank you for the notice of this question earlier this afternoon. In the first instance, I am not going to comment on media reports regarding these matters. I do not believe that is appropriate in dealing with such sensitive issues, consistent with my statement to Senate Estimates hearings in February. Discussion of specific or detailed and sensitive information in a public forum is not desirable. I will restate exactly what the Prime Minister said at the time regarding this incident um, and others in the House of Representatives. I do not propose to go into the detail of these operational matters, but our cyber experts believe that a sophisticated state actor is responsible for this activity. Second, Senators will appreciate that it is important that the parliament speaks with one voice on such matters. And just as briefings and management of these issues involve both the Speaker of the House of Representatives and myself, the decision to outline further information is something I will always confer with the Speaker about prior to any statement I make or information I provide. <coughs> I have obviously had a limited opportunity to do so in the time since notified of this question. However, I can confirm that there have been numerous and ongoing discussions between the Speaker and myself and the Department of Parliamentary Services and relevant authorities and agencies regarding the security of the parliamentary network. This remains a matter of the highest priority. I intend to provide a further update at Senate Supplementary Budget Estimates hearings next month. 
I restate, however, that some of these matters are not appropriately dealt with in a public forum. I can, however, also state that I am advised there has been no recurrence of the intrusion and the parliamentary network remains secure. Senator Patrick. Mr President, thank you for that. And, uh, I note you may not uh, be able to answer this, but perhaps may take it on notice. Uh, in your joint statement uh, with the Speaker on the 8th of February, you advised that there was, there was, and I quote, no evidence that any data had been accessed or taken at this time. However, this will remain subject to ongoing investigation. Uh, given the ASD investigation has been complete, can you now advise whether or not uh, information was taken and what the scale of any breach was? Thank you, Senator Patrick. DPS evidence supports the information provided by agencies that a small amount of data was taken and that none of it was deemed sensitive. Individual parliamentarians would be contacted by DPS if there was an impact. However, I do commit to providing further information on notice that is appropriate for public dissemination. Senator Patrick. Mr President, following your statement of 12 February, what further work has been undertaken by the Department of Parliamentary Services and ASD to ensure that malicious actors are excluded from the parliamentary network and that information of senators and members is fully protected? What further briefings uh, have or will be provided to senators to ensure that they and their staff are fully aware of what they need to do to ensure the security of the parliamentary network? Thank you, Senator Patrick. Just as the Department of Parliamentary Services worked extensively with relevant agencies in managing this incident, work is ongoing to ensure security of the network. This work involves both technical solutions, but also educating users of the network to exercise due caution in, for example, inadvertent exposure of it. As I said in my statement on February 18, quote, it is now everyone's responsibility to ensure the security of information. DPS is currently arranging briefings for staff of parliamentarians in October and November to improve cyber security awareness. New senators were provided with briefings at the commencement of this parliament, and dedicated briefing sessions for senators and their staff can be arranged on request. There will be further announcements in coming weeks regarding programs to assist users of the network in this regard. Some matters under consideration may require changes to utilisation of the net network from members, senators and staff. The Speaker and I are currently considering these and other issues. An announcement will be made following consultation and the development of implementation plans. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how today's release of the ABS labour force figures for the month of August demonstrates how a strong budget is continuing to support the creation of record jobs growth? Order. When the interjection tenor stops, I'll call the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Chandler for her question. And indeed, the labour force figures released today for August 2019 show that the economy under a coalition government continues— Order, Senator Cormann. On the point of order, uh, inter interjections are disorderly. I know that Senator Watt might be from a union background, but he doesn't have to constantly interject at Senator Cash. Order. Um, I, have, I, I, I have asked Senator Order. I, I have asked Senator Watt on a couple of occasions to count to five after I call him to order. I'm going to now ask him to count to ten slowly before he interjects and breaks standing orders again. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And as I was saying, the labour force figures for August 2019 show that the economy continues to create jobs uh, under the Morrison government. In fact, almost 35,000 jobs <laughs> were created in the month of August, and employment has now risen, Mr. President, for 35 consecutive months in a row. 35 consecutive months in a row. This is actually the longest consecutive Order. run of jobs in over 40 years. Mr President, we also continue to see record jobs growth. Total employment is now at almost 13 million. That is, Mr President, a record high. We also have a record number of young Australians uh, in employment, with almost 2 million Australians aged between 18 and 24 now in work. In terms of the creation of full-time jobs, Mr President, in the last 12 months, over 186,000 
full-time jobs have been created in the past year. And as of August 2019, almost 1.45 million Australians are in jobs since the coalition was elected to government in 2013. And in terms of the participation rate, Mr. President, it is at a record high of 66.2 per cent. What does that say about the Australian people? They are putting their hands up. They are encouraged by the employment growth. They are voting with their feet as our finance minister, incredibly successful finance minister, given what he brought down today, colleagues, absolutely has said they are putting their hands up and saying we are ready, willing and able Order. to work Senator and Cash. we have confidence. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank Something. you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, what further initiatives is the Morrison government taking to allow more Australians to benefit from the dignity of work? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, very much, uh, Senator Chandler, for the supplementary question. And of course, we understand that governments don't create jobs, Mr. President. The employers, industries out there, they are the job creators of this country. We put in place the economic framework under which we want them, and they certainly are prospering, growing and creating more jobs for Australians. Mr Morrison, our Prime Minister, who is on his way to the USA, what has he said to the Australian people? We will put in place the right economic conditions so that the economy can create an additional 1.25 million jobs over the next five years. How are we doing this? By supporting an even stronger economy. Mr President, again, our finance minister returning the budget to surplus in 2019-20, something that, as our finance minister stated, colleagues, when he addressed us earlier, something those opposite haven't managed to do since 1989. We understand the benefits of a strong economy Order, and Cash. we'll put in place the right policy. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Is the minister aware of any alternative approaches that might risk these record figures. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And I will take that interjection from Senator Watt, who said that might actually work. Well, Senator Watt, guess what? The policies that you took to the election were voted overwhelmingly by the Australian people as those that would not work. They rejected your policies on the 18th of May. What did they in particular reject, colleagues? I think the Australian people rejected Labor's plans to rip $387 billion out of the economy through their big taxing agenda. That would have affected, of course, the retirees in this country, out of homeowners' pockets, out of small business owners' pockets. What Labor and those on the other side don't understand is you cannot tax your way to prosperity. You cannot just tax, tax, tax and then spend, spend, spend. That is how you actually contract an economy. That is how you ultimately destroy jobs in this country. We Order, believe Senator in a strong Cash. economy and are putting in place the, the right— Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Yesterday, the minister supported the inquiry proposed by Senator Hanson into the family law system. My question is, was the Office for Women consulted on the inquiry? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I uh, thank Senator O'Neill for her question. Uh, as we discussed uh, in this chamber and in the other place yesterday, uh, the announcement of, uh, of this inquiry is uh, recognition of the government's commitment to ongoing improvement of the family law system to ensure that it helps families to separate in a safe, child-centred, supportive, accessible and timely way. And so we did move to establish a joint parliamentary committee of both the House and the Senate to conduct a wide-ranging inquiry into the family law system. That inquiry will be chaired by the Honourable Kevin Andrews MP, the member for Menzies, who has considerable experience across his uh, lengthy parliamentary career with these issues. Uh, and indeed, the Senate passed the motion yesterday to establish the uh, committee. This inquiry is going to enable the members and senators Senator who are members of the committee. On a point of order. Yes, Mr. President, I have, I think, given the minister sufficient time to come to an answer in response to my one query, which was about a particular consultation with the Office for Women. I did not ask about anything else. 
I would like an answer to that very specific question. Senator Cormann on the point of order. On the point of order, uh, the, the question that the um, senator is asking about is not actually in relation to an initiative in this chamber by executive government. It was a motion moved by a backbench senator, Senator uh, O'Sullivan, supported by Senator Chandler and Senator Bernardi. Uh, so, I mean, in all of those circumstances, uh, essentially, Senator uh, Pine is asked to provide commentary in relation to a backbench senator's initiative. Senator Wong? No. Mr. President, I wasn't going to rise, but the last point, on the point of direct relevance, uh, the leader of the government is saying we're asking the minister to provide commentary. We're asking her to advise whether an office within her portfolio was consulted. On the point of order, I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question. The, but prior to the specific question, which I appreciate you have emphasised, Senator O'Neill, you did make an assertion about the minister's behaviour in the chamber yesterday, about supporting a particular resolution. I believe the minister is being directly relevant to that part of the question when explaining the, what, what I am hearing as an explanation for the position she adopted. I don't mean to misattribute, but I believe that is directly relevant. Senator O'Neill, on the point of order. Thank you for your ruling, Mr President. But if I were simply to come to the chamber and ask the question, was the Office for Women consulted on the inquiry and did not give you the context in which I was asking that question, the minister would be incapable of answering it. I gave the context because it was required for comprehension of the question, not as an excuse for this minister to avoid answering oh, the Senator, question. Senator was she consulted Senator or was she not? I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question. There is an opportunity for debating, the debating what people view of answers after question time. That goes for half an hour. Um, I call, it was a relatively specific question, but I believe the minister is being directly relevant to the assertion made prior to the bit that you quoted then. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And this is a matter which uh, those on this side take very seriously. I don't have the full details of the government consultation process uh, with me in the chamber this afternoon. I'll take that part of the question on notice. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. And thank you, Mr President. And I do appreciate the minister taking that on notice. Um, did, the minister, did the Prime Minister inform the minister of his intention to announce the inquiry with Senator Hanson as chair before or after he did a deal with Senator Hanson. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I don't discuss my conversations with the Prime Minister or other Cabinet colleagues in the Senate chamber. It's a matter of long-standing practice. But I would point out that, as I said, in fact, in my answer, to which Senator O'Neill so objected, that the inquiry is being chaired by the Honourable Kevin Andrews. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Was the minister's view simply ignored? by the Prime Minister in his deal with Senator Hanson? Or is the minister siding with men's rights activists instead of supporting anti-family violence campaigner Rosie Batty, who says this inquiry is, and I quote, completely unacceptable? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I have a long-standing uh, relationship, professional relationship with uh, Ms Batty, who helped me uh, immeasurably in the development of the Department of Human Services uh, anti-domestic violence campaign uh, entitled Enough to support both staff and customers of uh, the Department of uh, Human Services uh, and perpetrators, uh, frankly, who had uh, experienced or were victims of or survivors of domestic violence. So my respect and regard for Ms Batty is uh, well known and well on the record. As a Minister for Women in the uh, round tables that I have been holding since I was appointed to this role in uh, May of this year, Mr President, uh, it has been my practice to ensure that at any of my discussions uh, around violence and the impact of gender-based and family violence on women and children in this country, that there are always survivors at that table, Mr President, because they, they tell their story better than anyone, and I respect that enormously. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much. Order. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Mackenzie. The success of the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund demonstrates the Liberal and National Government's enormous commitment to regional and northern Australia. Senator, Senator Smith, please. Re I asked a senator on my left to start their question again the other day because I missed parts of it due to interjections on my right. I'm going to ask Senator Smith to start his question and start the clock again because I couldn't hear part of the question. Senator Smith. Senator Watt might just like to wait for the answer. 
My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Senator Mackenzie. The success of the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Fund demonstrates the Liberal and Nationals government's enormous commitment to regional and northern Australia. Can the Minister outline to the Senate this afternoon recent developments from the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Fund and how a strong budget will help create jobs? And investment in my home state of Western Australia. Minister representing the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Smith, uh, for your question and for your very proud advocacy of your home state and for Northern Australia. To date, the NAIF has committed $1.4 billion in investment across Northern Australia, supporting projects which are forecast to create more than 4,000 jobs and $3 billion in public benefits. NAIF has now approved loans to six projects in WA to a total of $307.8 million. More than 1,300 jobs will be created across these projects during construction and operation. And I'm pleased to announce that the Australian Aboriginal Mining Corporation has today secured a Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility loan to develop its first iron ore mining project, eight kilometres northwest of Newman. This $12.5 million loan from the NAIF will help fund the nation's first substantially Indigenous-owned and operated iron ore pro mine, a project that will support hundreds of jobs in the Pilbara. This project will create more than 120 new jobs during construction and support around another 120 ongoing jobs during its operations. As Australia's first substantially Indigenous-owned and operated iron ore mine, First Iron Ore will also offer the region's Aboriginal community significant employment opportunities. The project will provide iron ore to Fortescue Mining Group's cloud break operations, with the first delivery of ore expected to happen by mid-next year. It's projected to run for at least five years, producing between two and three million wet tonnes of iron ore each year. The NAIF loan will help to build a range of new supporting infrastructure, including accommodation, a bore field, a crushing plant and a 55-kilometre haul road to connect Great Northern Highway, Highway to the Cloud Break Mine. It's a significant project to demonstrate the NAIF, NAIF's vital role in delivering infrastructure, creating jobs and boosting the economy right across uh, Northern Australia. Senator Smith, supplementary question. Senator Watts gone quiet. Can the minister can the minister outline can the minister <laughs> order can the minister outline to the Senate can the, can the minister outline to the Senate how stability and certainty in Northern Australia infrastructure is helping build a stronger economy for the north of Western Australia? Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Senator Smith. The Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Board has made a total of 13 investment decisions and two conditional credit approvals. Uh, of those investment decisions, six have been in WA and 13 projects in WA are going through due diligence. The Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility has approved $308 million in loans for WA, including $74 million loan comprised of two components for the Beyond the Sulfate of a Potash project. Uh, the $95 million loan to Sheffield Resources, $16.8 million for Onslow uh, Marine Support Base to widen and deepen the channel and extend and expand the wharf. Mid last year, the Liberal National Government amended the NAIF investment mandate to increase its flexibility, facilitating acceleration investment decisions and improve its potential to support projects to deliver more jobs and economic opportunities across Northern Australia. Of the investment decisions Order. made, Senator McKenzie, time for the answers expired. Senator Smith, the final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate what the Liberal and Nationals government is doing to build a stronger economy, deliver better roads, and create real jobs across all of regional and rural Western Australia? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. The Liberal National Government has committed over $6.8 billion to fund land transport infrastructure projects in WA over the next 10 years. This includes $682 million to complete the remaining two stages of the Bunbury Outer Ring Road and $140 million towards the Albany Ring Road. These commitments will divert heavy vehicle traffic away from the city centre, which will improve freight productivity and amenity for those regional centres. It also includes $535 million for key upgrades in WA under the ROSI, the Roads of Strategic Importance Program. These projects will upgrade key com commuter and freight corridors across Australia, improving connectivity for regional communities and industries. And in WA, these projects include the Newman to Catherine Corridor, the Alice Springs to Halls Creek Corridor, 
the Caratha to Tom Price corridor. The Liberal National Government has also committed $171.8 million for road projects under the Northern Australia Roads Program in WA. And these Order. projects Senator include McKenzie. a whole Time lot of stuff. Time for the answer stuff. has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the minister representing the Minister for Northern Australia, Senator McKenzie. I refer to the government's flagship Northern Australia infrastructure facility, which was announced in June 2015, two prime ministers ago. Four years on, how much of this $5 billion fund has actually been drawn down to support new infrastructure in Northern Australia? How many projects have actually drawn down and received funding from the NAIF four years on? The Minister representing the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Senator McKenzie. Yes, well, I have about 20 folders here today. Uh, well, as I said earlier, um, Senator Watt, uh, the NAIF has actually uh, got 13 projects underway, uh, including the projects I actually spoke about to uh, the Senator Smith earlier. We've made 13 investment decisions and one conditional uh, credit report. The total investment of the NAIF value is now approximately $1.4 billion, supporting projects with an estimated total capital value of $2.8 billion, including those getting conditional approval. Investment decisions are for three projects in the Northern Territory, six in WA and four in your home state of Queensland, Senator Watt. $781 million for Queensland, $184 million for the Northern Territory and $307 order. million on for Western. <coughs> uh, Mr President, I know it's Thursday on a sitting fortnight, the last Thursday on a sitting fortnight, but um, interjections are disorderly. And Senator Watt is a repeat offender uh, and I ask you to call him to order. Order. Senator Watt, I will ask you to cease dejecting on your own question. You have two supplementaries afterwards to follow up. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, combined, the three investment decisions are forecast to generate around $2.55 billion in public benefit uh, across Northern Australia, which includes a forecast of over 3,700 jobs, both in construction and during operations. Drawdowns have commenced for three projects, Senator Watt. As at the 27th of August 2019, the department has made a total payments of $41.8 million, comprised of Order. one $15.7 million Order, for Senator the on site marine uh, support base project, $23.5 million to the Voyages Indigenous Tourism Australia project, and $2.598 million to the Humpty Doo Barramundi project. So, as you can see, not only is the NAIF under its uh, renewed mandate approving projects uh, thoroughly—13, as I said—but it's also ensuring the money gets out the door and these vital projects are started providing much needed construction jobs uh, and those in ongoing operations. Senator Watt, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank the minister for admitting that after four years, only about $40 million has actually been released by the NAIF uh, at an average of less than about $10 million per year. Is the minister concerned that at this rate it will take her 500 years to distribute the NAIF's total funding of $5 billion. Is this why, across Northern Australia, people refer to the NAIF as the No Actual Infrastructure Fund? Senator McKenzie. Oh, 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 Senator Watt. Senator Watt, I am absolutely confident that under its renewed mandate, as I outlined in my question uh, answer to Senator Smith, uh, increasing the fle flexibility etc., uh, for the NAIF when it's considering projects that come before it, uh, that we will be seeing uh, faster approval times for projects that are identified. And as those uh, contracts are being negotiated with proponents, that the money will start rolling out. But we're just not going to throw the money out, Senator Watt. We're just not going to give anybody that rocks up to the NAIF 
uh, with you know Order. some brainstorm of an idea, some you know far-fetched fantasy uh, off the coast of Darwin or, or Cairns or something. What we're actually going to do is set up a process so these projects can actually be assessed appropriately so that the taxpayer's dollar uh, can be spent appropriately to deliver much needed jobs and economic stimulus to northern Australia. Senator Watt, final supplementary question. Mr. President, nearly one year ago, Minister Canavan said that Queensland was poised to generate huge benefit from the NAIF. Can the minister confirm? that not one project in my home state of Queensland has actually received funding from the NAIF. Senator McKenzie. Uh, Senator Watt, the Townsville Airport Redevelopment Project. On 8 January 2019, the NAIF made an investment decision for a loan of up to $50 million to Townsville Airport Senator Upgrade Watt. Project. The project includes substantial refurbishment to the terminal, more aircraft parking, better road access and upgrade to core infrastructure as part order. of the Senator $80 million dollar project. Order. Relevance. The question was about projects receiving funding, not being approved for funding. Well, Senator Cormann on the point of order. I, I think, um, on the point of order, I, I think that Senator McKenzie was being incredibly yeah. helpful. Yeah. Uh, and I think that you can't order. Uh, are you, I, I, would, I would commend to you that you rule that the minister is being directly relevant to the question as it was asked by Senator Watt. I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question. The minister was being directly relevant. If, if the person asking the question does not like it, they have an opportunity after question time to debate it. That is a matter for debate. I do not think it is a matter of direct relevance. I call Senator McKenzie to continue. Thank you very much, Mr President. <laughs> Look, there's a lot of, as I said, 13 projects, several in your home state of Queensland have been approved. And the process. Order. Senator the Cormann process, on a point of order. Uh, I, I'm, I'm committed to training uh, Senator Watt into compliance with standing <laughs> orders. And it is under standing orders, it's disorderly to interject. It is in order, it's disorderly to interject, and I would ask you to call him uh, to order. Yeah. Senator Watt, you've been particularly voluble this week. I'm going to ask you to attempt to restrain your passions for the next four and a half minutes. Senator McKenzie. Thank you. Uh, so we've got the Townsville Airport, also James Cook University, the 3rd of July, announcing NAIF loan of up to $98 million for technology and innovation complex at James Cook University. Now, the usual process would be uh, these proponents come forward with their project and enter a process of negotiation with the NAIF to make sure that we can tick off with confidence that taxpayer dollar is not going to be wasted on these projects. Are order, they going Senator through McKenzie, that process? Time for the answers expired. Senator, order. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Mr President. I note this is not my first speech. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister advise the Senate on Australia's priorities at the United Nations General Assembly meeting next week? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. It's a great pleasure to take a question from my friend Senator Henderson uh, here in this place yeah, yeah. and on such an important matter. Australia's engagement with the United Nations is a very important part of our efforts to ensure a safe, a secure, a prosperous Australia by working with our international partners to strengthen the rules and institutions that underpin a free, open, inclusive global order. And with that in mind, I will be attending the 74th session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York next week. Beginning with the Climate Action Summit, as well as high-level meetings on a range of policy areas, including disaster-resilient infrastructure led by India, universal health coverage, sustainable development goals, Mr. President, these are going to be very important engagements on key policy areas of concern and interest to Australia. We have a great history a strong track record of achievement in the UN. We work collaboratively to identify solutions to the world's most intractable problems uh, with our key partners. The International Forum of the United Nations is an important opportunity for us to use that reputation, that standing, to lead on these issues that are important to us. Mr. President, the Prime Minister himself will be outlining our national values and principles in his address to the General Assembly following his state visit to Washington where he will, of course, uh, be affirming the enduring alliance of a key strategic partner, the United States. Our engagement in the uh, UN, Mr. President, where we have been 
active, we've been creative, we've been effective, including in our position on the Security Council uh, some few years ago, really contributes to the establishment, the consolidation of this rules-based international order that supports our interests. Our financial contributions, comprised of our assessed and voluntary contributions, our humanitarian and development funding, our peacekeeping contributions, are all part of Australia's engagement across the panoply of issues that have to be addressed through important Order, multilateral Payne, processes. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister provide further details to the Senate on Australia's particular priorities regarding global security issues? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we know that today threats are global in their reach. It's true for terrorism. It's true for nuclear weapons. It's true for cyber security. And tackling these threats with our international partners helps in keeping Australians safer. At next, meet, next week's meetings, I'll continue our engagement with key partners to develop norms that compel better international behaviour in cyberspace. I'll encourage other nations to join the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty as a step towards arms control and to prepare for the review of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. These are important confidence-building measures for nuclear arms control. I will also deliver Australia's national statement at the 10th Global uh, Terrorism Counterterrorism Forum. Conscious of the ongoing challenges of combating the threat of terrorist activity in our region uh, and globally, and with particular reference to our hosting of the 2019 No Money for Terror Conference Order. in Melbourne later Senator this year. Payne. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate on other areas of focus for Australia at next week's United Nations General Assembly? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. It is obviously a, a vast range of opportunities for Australia to engage, but we will particularly use next week's Climate Action Summit to convey Australia's steadfast commitment to the Paris Agreement, stressing that our contribution includes building climate and disaster resilience in the Pacific. I'll also represent Australia on a panel for the sustainable oceans economy because we know that economic production and ocean protection must go hand in hand. We also take a leadership role on human rights in these fora, Mr President. In recent weeks, I travelled to Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh where close to one million Rohingya people from Myanmar have taken refuge. I will be discussing also with counterparts how we can make progress on this very difficult problem and how we are also able to support the response to the ongoing humanitarian crisis. Here, here. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. Yesterday I was asked a question in relation to uh, home care providers. Um, just a moment, Minister. Um, I've got a minister on his feet. I ask people to be silent as they're leaving the chamber and allow the minister to be heard. Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. Yesterday I was asked a question by Senator Urquhart about home care providers uh, uh, and quality reviews of home care providers. Of the 929 home care providers currently registered in um, Australia, there is currently one that, has, that is overdue for a quality review, uh, but that provider has had a one-day monitoring review uh, that's been undertaken while that process um, works through, uh, and there is currently one home care provider that is under sanction. Thank you, Minister. Uh, are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Rustin to the questions asked by Senators Billick and Gallagher today. Uh, well, what a shameful performance we've seen from government ministers today, in particular Senator Cormann, as the Minister for Finance and Leader of the Senate, Leader of the Government in the Senate. We saw Senator Cormann backed in by many of his ministers, including Senator Seselja, coming in here crowing about a budget deficit that is 100 per cent built on a gross underspending of the NDIS. Now, rather than using those sort of jargonistic terms, let's actually think about what this actually means to people out there in the real world. What it means is that we have had government ministers come in here today 
crowing about a budget result, which remains in deficit years after they were elected, that is built on denying people with a disability wheelchairs, therapy support and other services that they are entitled to under the NDIS. It is shameful enough that this government has denied people with a disability things like wheelchairs, other kinds of aids, therapy, whether it be speech therapy, other types of support, psychological support. It is shameful enough that this, min that this minister and this government have denied that type of support of people, but to then have the hide to come in here and crow about that budget result just shows you what a mean, nasty government this is, completely lacking in empathy for people with a disability. They have deliberately slowed down the rollout of the NDIS, forced people to wait to get a meeting to develop an NDIS plan that sets out the kind of support they need. The average waiting time for these plans just continues to blow out and is now running at more than four months. So not only are they making people wait to get a meeting and to get a plan which determines the support that they need, but even once people finally get a plan, months down the track, they then have to wait months and months and months to get the support that the government has agreed to provide them. And the neat little accounting trick that this provides for this government is that it helps them cover up their budget failures and ends up delivering a budget result that, is ma that masks this terrible cruelty which is being meted out by this government by making people wait for months upon months to get the disability support that they need, they have been promised and that has actually been funded in the government's budget, if only it would decide to follow through and spend the money that they put aside. Now, I asked my office in preparing to speak today to give me an update on constituents that we have assisted uh, deal with the NDIS and deal with the delays uh, that they are experiencing. And this is not something that unique, is unique to me. I'm sure that even government senators in their more honest moments would concede that complaints from people who are waiting for disability packages under the NDIS is now by far the greatest source of complaint brought by people to senators and members of parliament offices right around the country. Certainly every other member of parliament and senator that I speak to says um, that this is the number one complaint that they receive from constituents, is the delays that people are experiencing in getting the NDIS support that they need and that they have been promised. And I've, I've, it didn't take long to get some examples back from my office, and I'll just give one. Uh, Natasha from central Queensland. I won't give the name of her daughter, but her seven-year-old daughter has autism. Uh, they applied for their NDIS uh, package in March last year. By the end of July, she still hadn't heard anything more. She only ended up getting a plan after my, my office intervened on her behalf, and that caused her seven-year-old daughter to lose months of time-critical speech therapy. Uh, and only, it was only because of the actions of a generous psychologist that her daughter was able to continue receiving behaviour therapy. I could give a number of other examples that my office has come up with within an hour today of people out there in the community who continue to wait for the NDIS services that they were promised by this government and the fact that this government is relying on hundreds and thousands, in fact I think we calculated it's about 71,000 people who are waiting for NDIS packages, it is that denial of services, it is the fact that people are waiting for wheelchairs and therapy services that is propping up this government's budget. That is an absolute disgrace, and the fact they come in and here and crow about it is even worse. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of the, the answer given uh, on the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Uh, I find it quite um, challenging that uh, those opposite would uh, want to use uh, the political uh, point scoring here. Uh, the reality is this is a very important program that exists. It's a very, very important program that exists. In fact, it's one of the, uh, the biggest social reforms in Australia's history. 
the NDIS has undergone significant growth from approximately 30,000 participants at the end of the 30th of June 2016 to almost 300,000 participants as at the 30th of June 2019. This is a significant increase. Uh, 100,000 of those participants are receiving support and services for the very first time. And to, 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 to take the point uh, and to use the, the plight of individuals in this way uh, and uh, to politicise it, I think, is a shameful act that we're seeing from those opposite. Uh, since the commencement of NDIS, the active provider market has, always, uh, has also grown uh, from around 3,500 service providers as at the 30th of June 2016 to more than 21,000 as at the 30th of June 2019, an increase of 600 per cent. 600 per cent an increase. We know that the number of participants entering the NDIS are lower than originally estimated. As at the 30th of June 2019, there were 298,816 participants who had received disability support from the NDIS representing 72 per cent of the original bilateral estimates. The progress has been consistent throughout the NDIS trial and transition phase. The minister, when giving answer to the question uh, from those opposite, uh, spoke about the fact and gave the analogy of this is they inherited like a plane that's flying in the air that was only half built. This government was responsible for building the NDIS and working with the states with the transition and they have been working on that while it's still flying in the air. And they've built the, 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 the system and it's now been rolled out. And we're seeing the product of that. And we're seeing the differences that have been made. And those opposite are, are prepared to just sort of give an example for political point scoring across the chamber without any real uh, substance or evidence. Uh, we know, as I speak to backbenchers and other colleagues uh, in the other place, uh, when Given the nature of this system and the complexity of it and, the, of course, the, the, the difficulty that those that are, are having to uh, uh, use it are, are finding, when they bring their issues forward to, uh, in, a, in a constructive way to, uh, to, to members uh, and senators, uh, those members and senators are able to take those issues to uh, the minister responsible. And we're hearing from around uh, the country of how those issues are being dealt with. Of course there's going to be situations, of course there's going to be administrative problems and issues that come up from time to time. But this government and the minister responsible for this is active in resolving those issues and I think he ought to be commended for the work that he's doing in such a, a quick time. We're hearing that things are able to be turned around within 24 to 48 hours. So rather than just bringing cases into this place, and expect that, you know, that, that these issues can be resolved. Why don't you actually bring forward the, the challenges and the issues in a, in a constructive way, deal with this government, bring them forward so that they can be dealt with, like what we're seeing on our side of the chamber? Despite the best efforts of the National Disability Insurance Agency, the NDIA, as well as Commonwealth and state and territory governments, there are some people who may be eligible for the NDIS who remain difficult to contact and engage with. So we are aware of the challenges in this situation, and we are focused on that. The, uh, the question that could have been noted today could have been the question that was given of the, uh, the NAIF program and what Senator McKenzie gave. Uh, we, we were able to announce today, this government, a loan that has gone to an Aboriginal-owned business, an, an Aboriginal-owned mining company, the first of its kind in this country, who are employing people, who are providing employment for people in the Pilbara, in my home state of Western Australia. This is where we should be focusing our efforts in, 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 in discussing these things, how we can actually assist Australians to get ahead and, and make better use of the, the resources that they have so that they can make a better future for themselves, rather than this typical political point scoring. Thank you, Senator that we hear O'Sullivan. Your time has expired. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, what we saw in question time today was a real performance of hubris, callousness and disinterest. And we saw that from a number of people who have participated uh, through question time and in this debate as well. And I think the hubris comes down to the way that they are trying to triumphantly declare uh, their economic credentials. Uh, and what we know from those of us who spend time out on the ground, 
how tough people are really doing it. But if you listen to the performance of this government today in question time, uh, press conferences throughout the day as well, they are acting like Australia is going great guns and that everyone should be so happy with their lot in life because this government is saving the day. Well, we know the reality is different and, more importantly, the Australian people know the reality is different for them. But there's also a callousness with this decision as well because ultimately they made choices about this and that's what this is all about. But they made a choice to underspend in the NDIS. They made a choice for people to suffer longer than they need to so they can try and claim some economic credibility. Uh, and that is really disgusting behaviour, as Senator Watt outlined. And then I think we saw disinterest as well, particularly under questioning uh, Senator Rushton, where she was not prepared to actually answer the questions that the legitimate questions that we were putting to her around the underspending in the NDIS, what it actually means for those people, and providing examples uh, of what that means for people uh, out there in the community that are suf suffering as a result of inaction on this government. And for there to be an underspend, what it means is people are not getting the services that they deserve, that they need. So we outlined that, on average, people are waiting 127 days to receive an NDIS plan after being deemed eligible. So they've been, de been deemed eligible, and on average they are waiting 127 days. Uh, some are waiting as long as 202 days, and I, I would be confident to say that a lot of those people are in remote and regional areas uh, who are waiting the longest for those plans to come through. And I think it is disgusting that they want to try and blame the previous Labor government that started the NDIS. Six years uh, they have been in power, more than six years they have been in power, yet on this issue they are still trying to blame the previous Labor government. Uh, those families uh, who need these plans, those kids and adults uh, who need help, deserve so much better from this government than blaming the previous Labor government. That is absolutely disgusting. But I think it also goes, is important to highlight just how devastating the economic conditions are for those people across Australia. Uh, if you listen to the hubris from the government in terms of announcing uh, their budget outcome today, uh, they're saying that it's five minutes of sunshine and everyone is doing so well uh, and that the Australians have never had it so good. Well, we know the reality is different and the Australian people know the reality is different as well. So let's go through some of the facts that uh, Labor have outlined today that is confronting the Australian people. Uh, we've got the slowest growth in this economy since the GFC 10 years ago. Uh, wages are stagnant. Household debt is at record highs. Living standards and productivity are in decline. And today we learn that unemployment is rising and we've got the most Australians underemployed looking for more hours at work than we've ever had in the history of this country. So that's more Australians underemployed than ever before in our history. And that includes 228,000 underemployed people in Queensland. And as Senator Watt would know, as Senator Green would know, as we spend time travelling around Queensland, we come across these people all the time. And I know that they would look at the performance of this government today and be appalled. Because we know the economic reality out there in Queensland, out there in regional Queensland, is vastly different to the hubris and arrogance you get from this government. And Australians and Queenslanders are in a tough spot, but this government is continuing to try and bask in the glory of their election win. They're on a victory lap. That's all they are trying to do is say, how good are we? We won the election. Uh, everything is going to be great. Well, the Australian people need a plan. Uh, they know that the economy is struggling. Uh, what they want to see is more urgent investment in infrastructure. They know that it's going to kick-start economies, particularly regional economies, which in Queensland we know the unemployment rate is higher in those parts of the world, be it along the coast, be it in western Queensland. So I'd say to this government, please have a look at the reality out there and take action for the good of the Australian people. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Antic. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Acting President. I also rise to take note of answers given uh, this afternoon. And I have to say uh, from the start, um, Madam Deputy Acting President, that, that it is of no difficulty for, my, for me to stand up here and defend the government's 
uh, position with respect to the delivery in the, of the rollout of the NDIS scheme. Um, Madam Deputy Acting President, this is an enormous undertaking. Uh, it's an enormous undertaking and it's one which the government has handled uh, extraordinarily well. We heard Minister Rustin uh, earlier on this afternoon uh, speak to the issue of, uh, of what was left behind by the Labor government uh, prior to um, coming to government in 2013. And very aptly, uh, I thought she, she referred to it as being a little bit like uh, a plane that took off but before it had been fully built. Um, the NDIS, uh, as my colleague uh, Senator O'Sullivan mentioned before, uh, is now available across all states and territories. And over 300,000 people with a disability have now joined the NDIS, including over 100,000 those receiving support for the first time. Um, it is, in fact, uh, correct to say uh, that uh, now between 83 and 90 per cent of participants have rated their experience with the NDIS as either good or very good during the transition from the 1st of July 2016. Um, the outcomes are also showing significant improvements. 9 uh, a 9 per cent increase in independence for children aged between 7 and 14 years, 7 per cent increase in assistance with daily living for participants aged 15 to 25, and 11 per cent increase uh, in accessing community and social activities for participants aged 15 and over. Um, the, the list goes on, Madam Deputy Acting President. Um, significantly improved services throughout the NDIS contact centre. Around 83 per cent of calls are answered within 60 seconds compared to a four to five minute wait time under the previous model. Uh, the average answer speed is now consistently at 28 seconds and the average abandonment rates are now reliably sitting at 1.5 per cent. Um, there is uh, such a, a long list of uh, improvements that it, it, it is, uh, it's almost uh, tried to go through them all, but it, it strikes me, Madam Deputy Acting President, that what we're hearing from the other side of the chamber uh, at the moment is, is nothing more really than uh, a lecture on, uh, on, on, the, on our dedication to this, this plan, and our dedication is very, very evident, and we won't be lectured by the Labor Party um, on our dedication and performance in rolling out the NDIS. Um, this is, strikes me, to be, uh, Madam Deputy Acting President, as being almost like one of those radio shows with the uh, guess the sound type campaign. Uh, and to me, this sounds very much like the, uh, the sound of clutching at straws, Madam De Deputy Acting President, because we know that the contrast between the government uh, and the opposition is the contrast between a stable and united government getting on with a job, with a clear plan, delivering on promises, versus the Labor Party that's conflicted on policy and tarnished by scandal. So what we've seen here is, is uh, you know, uh, at, at best, a very thinly veiled attempt to try and, uh, to try and attack the government on something which really is, uh, is quite... Uh, Quite extraordinary. I mean, you only have to look back uh, to uh, what, you know, Labor leaving behind a funding gap of almost five billion dollars for the NDIS when it was fully rolled out, growing to almost seven billion a year over the next decade. Madam Deputy Acting President, uh, these are extraordinary uh, statistics. And if we had continued down that path, down Labor's path, these higher than expected package costs would have resulted in multi-billion dollar blowouts in the total cost of the NDIS, putting its entire future at risk. So this government has, um, has continued to, uh, to roll out improvements. It has continued to, uh, uh, to improve. And from my home state of South Australia, we're now seeing 30,000 South Australians who have benefited from this uh, life-changing support through the National uh, Disability Insurance Scheme. Everyday South Australians' lives are now being changed uh, by the support and the significant growth in numbers of people with disabilities now accessing the scheme. It's from 11,000 in uh, 2017 to over as I said, 30,000 this month of September 2019. Um, it is, uh, uh, it, it, of course, important to reiterate, as, as the government has earlier this afternoon, that the, the misunderstanding here is the misunderstanding which sur surrounds the concept of a demand-driven scheme. That really is uh, the basis of this. And, and of course, if, if the Labor Party were so uh, intent on outcomes, they would deliver uh, 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 notifications of those incidents rather than simply uh, try and score points during question time. So um, I, I, uh, I have to draw uh, the Parliament's attention or the Senate's attention uh, to all of these matters. Uh, Labor just doesn't seem to know what it stands for anymore, Madam Deputy Acting President. It, uh, it uh, doesn't seem to... Uh, Thank have... you, Senator Antic. Your Thank time you. has expired and I am the Deputy President. Senator Green. Thank you. Well, Labor knows exactly what it stands for. We stand 
for people with disabilities getting the services that they deserve and that they need. 77,000 Australians with disabilities are missing out. $4.6 billion has been underspent by this government. And yet, in question time, they want to parade around, they want to do their victory lap, talk about all of the great things that they've done, but they don't want to talk about this. They want to talk about anything other than the $4.6 billion that they have underspent. And it is a very disappointing thing to have to rise and talk about this, but it gives me a chance to make sure that this Senate knows that this is a particular problem in regional Queensland. We have people on waiting lists in regional Queensland that cannot wait any longer. In far north Queensland, people with disabilities and their families cannot get the services that they need and that they deserve. And that is not because they live far away from a capital city. It is not because they live in a regional area where we can't get staffing. It's because this government has failed to make this a priority. They have made their choice and they have not backed people with a disability. We have some incredible providers and families in Cairns, where I live, and it's been an honour for me to meet them and to talk to them about this issue. And I've been doing that for a long time before the election, and I'll continue to do that uh, as a senator based in Cairns. One of the things that I spoke to people about, providers particularly, uh, was uh, what they felt this underspend said to people with disabilities and vulnerable people. I asked them, what does that message send to people with a disability? And they said that, of course, it was disappointing. Um, but they also said it says to vulnerable people that the government doesn't care. And the people that I spoke to, the providers, the people with disabilities, their carers, were quick to point out that they didn't want to make this a political issue. But they had no choice because this government is playing politics with the lives of people with disabilities. They shouldn't have to wait any longer. Now, there's a, a particular person in far north Queensland that I'd like to talk about today, and his name is Stevie. He has Down syndrome, and he is the brightest, most beautiful person you will ever meet in your life. And his carer, his mum, Margie, is someone who gives every single ounce of her life and her time in her day to make sure that Stevie has the activities and the services to make his life better. And it really does break your heart to listen to the stories like Margie and Stevie. Stevie, who is a big fan of CrossFit and loves to do um, lots of exercise and services because they can't get the services that they need in far north Queensland. They live up on the tablelands, it's even further from Cairns, and the, the workers just aren't there. And the reason that that is the case is because this government has not prioritised investing in services and lifting the staffing cap. But I just want to make note of one more thing that Question Time today made evident once again, and it, that is that this minister is not up for the job. Senator Rustin failed to answer questions about the underspending of the NDIS, $4.6 billion. I mean, this is on top of comments around the pension being generous. We've had, she won't commit to raising New Start. This government doesn't want to hear about it. And then a few weeks ago, we found out that when it comes to robo-debt, robo -debt, she didn't know that people in Townsville were receiving robo-debt notices. When it comes to vulnerable Australians, this government either doesn't care or doesn't want to know, and they are not up to the job of looking after vulnerable people. This minister and this government are part of a characterisation of cruelty, of hiding facts, of hiding things in budget papers, because they don't care. It's always the way with this government. You open up the budget paper and there it is the truth, the facts that they're trying to hide. It's the same with infrastructure funding, and it's the same with this $4.6 billion of underspent money in the NDIS. Those 77,000 Australians deserve better than this government, 
better than the performance they saw in question Thank time you, today. Thank you, Senator Green. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Steele, John. I move to take note of the answer given by uh, the Special Minister of State to a question asked by my colleague, Senator Dean Natale. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, well, you know, I've seen some uh, silly nonsense uh, statements made in my short time here, uh, but uh, the answer given by, by uh, Minister Cormann uh, in relation to a, a great question by the Greens in relation to his support of public servants that will decide to go on strike tomorrow for climate action takes a bit of the cake. He had the cheek to say. He had the cheek to say that school kids uh, should stay in school rather than strike for climate action tomorrow. And it, it led me to think, you know, how does he feel leading a government where, when it comes to climate change, half his cabinet need to go back to school? That's right. I mean, you've got ministers questioning the fundamental connection uh, between humanity and climate change. These are questions that could be answered by any sixth grader in any classroom around the country. Equally as farcical in the course of this week have been an Australian Labour Party, the self-styled product of the union movement, whose fundamental core activity in the pursuit of justice for workers has been the utilisation of strike action, informing young people that they should strike on the weekend. My honourable colleague, the MLC for East Metro, uh, Tim Clifford, in the West Australian uh, Parliament, put that very uh, question uh, to the Premier. He asked the Premier whether uh, there would be any impact for public servants who decided to go on strike on Friday, and the Premier informed him that if they did so, they would be striking in their own time, implying that they would be docked a day of annual leave. My colleague uh, Michael Berkman, MP, in the Queensland Parliament, put it to uh, Noosa, uh, Queensland Premier Palaszczuk as to whether she supported students going on strike tomorrow, and she informed the chamber that she believed students should strike on the weekend. Never did I believe I would turn up to this place and find a Labour Party that didn't know what a strike was, or a government that didn't seem to contain members in senior portfolios dealing on the front line with the impacts of climate change who don't understand the same level of basic science as can be found in our primary schools. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, God for sake, seems like we've got a pretty ignorant bunch run in this country, and how I wish it was ignorance. How I wish it was that it was just simply as easy as sitting down with maybe a brightly coloured book and explaining to you people the science of climate change and therefore the need to act. But it is nowhere near as simple as that. You can be excused not by your ignorance, because it is not ignorance. You know exactly what you're doing. You know the connection between human beings and climate change. You know the connection between coal and the climate crisis. You know the connection between gas and the destruction of precious places such as the Great Barrier Reef. And you choose not to act. You choose not to act because you are bought and paid for by the very yep. fossil fuel in interests who are the perpetrators yep. of the climate crisis. And we see it never more clearly than in a WA Labour government who couldn't even bring itself to back its own Environmental Protection Agency when they made the radical suggestion that coal mines be made to counter their emissions during their lifetimes. 
that they simply put in place measures to counteract the emissions that they might be responsible for. That was shot down in two seconds by the Labour Premier. It just goes to show whatever colour the party is, if it takes money from fossil fuels, it can't be trusted on climate Thank change. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Steelejohn be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.